Hey, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, my name's Andrew. Uh, this is my colleague. I'm Shrenik Savalgi. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we work at uh, Wayfair.com up in Boston. And there's some things that I think are important to understand about Wayfair um, in the context of this presentation. So we're an online uh, destination for all things home. So uh, an e-commerce site uh, for furniture and home goods mostly. Um, we have a lot of products, over 7 million, um, 7,000 plus suppliers. So we have a very large data set. Um, we've been around since 2002. Uh, so the way, name Wayfair is actually a little newer. Uh, we kind of rebranded a few years ago. Uh, but we've been around for a while, and our code base has been around for a while. Uh, we have several large websites, Wayfair.com being the main one, but they all run on a shared code base. So for the most part, all our products share the same code. And uh, that code is a, a PHP backend, um, custom-built e-commerce platform and MVC platform, millions of lines of code, thousands of JavaScript modules. Um, so it's, it's an extensive uh, code base. Performance matters, right? Um, I, I know it's obvious, and I'll probably all of you know it, but I'm just going to state it anyway. Um, so a high-performant app can lead to a better customer experience. That, in turn, probably leads to uh, better revenue, right? And that's kind of important. Um, so uh, in order to get this high performance, uh, we are kind of doing uh, some things on the server side, at least. Um, yeah, so we have uh, we use Mustache and PHP on the server side, and we're actually rendering um, this stuff with a C++ extension, and that's like super fast. Um, we also lazy load um, most of our uh, non-critical images, like stuff below the fold. We lazy load data, and, and also like some JS modules. For example, if um, you have a model that you want to show, uh, and until you actually show it, we don't load the JS for it. Right. So um, we also do some intelligent bundling on the JavaScript side uh, for cache optimizations. Um, yeah, so we were doing a lot of things uh, right in terms of performance, but there was always room for improvement. And as our pages became more and more interactive, we realized that the uh, area where we could improve the most was the client side. Um, so we were using uh, Backbone on the client. And so Backbone works with jQuery uh, out of the box to do all your rendering. And so this is sort of a standard render method in Backbone. Uh, you implement your own render methods. So uh, in this method, basically just uh, taking the element for our view, um, using the jQuery object for that. That's been pre-selected uh, for us. And we're using jQuery.html to pass in our new string for our HTML. Uh, that's uh, acquired by using our template function that we've pre-compiled, calling render on it, and passing in our data. Um, and this is fine, but there are a couple of problems with it. Uh, one being we tend to over-render. So maybe only part of our view changes. Maybe we're only changing a class name or a text node. Uh, but what we're doing here in sort of a naive render method is we're re-rendering everything. We're re-rendering that view uh, no matter what changed. And in fact, we're re-rendering that view even if nothing changed. So even if nothing changed on our view, maybe if we're calling uh, render whenever our data model changes, which is a common pattern, uh, now we're re-rendering even when we don't need to. Uh, we're hitting the DOM if we don't have to. And that became problematic. Uh, the other end of this, to kind of compensate for this, is, well, devs will just use kind of precise DOM uh, manipulations. So we might take our, our jQuery object here and just call add class on it. Um, so that's fine. It's going to be fast. Uh, the problem is that this does not uh, scale. It's not maintainable as an architecture. Um, we started realizing that parts of our code base ended up being uh, uh, filled with these direct DOM manipulations. And it was very hard to reason about the state of our application at any one time. I mean, in addition to that, you know, devs have to think about kind of low level performance. Uh, you know, this would always come up in a code review. And you guys all work with JavaScript probably every day, so maybe you're familiar with this, you know, that jQuery.empty is actually a lot faster than passing an empty string to jQuery.html. But that's not something that all our full stack devs uh, were aware of, and it's not something they should have to be aware of. And so you know, you'd end up with all these little petty comments and code reviews, like this is faster than this, this is faster than this. And, and that just, we wanted a better abstraction for that. We didn't want to have, have devs have to worry about this sort of low-level DOM performance uh, when they're writing their code. So what do we do now? Like, yeah, uh, that was a good question. And that was a question that, that kind of faced our team. Um, how can we improve the client-side performance that we have uh, within our, our current stack? And you know, I think the, uh, the interesting solution was, like, let's just rewrite everything. Um, there's some really great libraries out there. right? We, we started looking around, and we could have rewritten Ember, because Ember's really cool now, and it has Glimmer, so it's kind of fast, and uh, there's a really great community. Um, there were some cool things going on with Angular. Um, we could have decided, you know, we're going to rewrite to Angular 2, and we'll do that this summer, and it'll be a, it'll be a project. But uh, at the end of the day, we'll have this, this cool Angular app for everything. 
to be honest, uh, what excited us the most was uh, React. So we looked at React and we were like, this is great. Um, if I were starting a side project, like this is exactly what I would use. Why don't we just rewrite everything to React? And I think as a dev, it's really exciting to like look at this and go, you know, imagine a greenfield project. Right? We have a legacy code base. Let's just delete everything and rewrite it again. But, but this thing, like the worst mistake that you can make is actually rewriting the entire thing. Like even Joel Spolsky agrees with me. So, I, but, yeah. So it's it's problematic, and that's disappointing. Um, I think as devs, we like want to take kind of the new and shiny uh, libraries and just use them. And so when we're sort of told we can't, that, that's, that's disappointing. But, but re rewrites are expensive. I mean, like, it, it, they take so much time. Like, you have to actually stop all feature development. You can't really, like, you know, like your, your product does not progress. So, um, and most of the times, you actually never get done with it because, it because of all these problems, right? And like, without actual tests, like, you're going to break a lot of stuff, right? Yeah, so the alternative is working with legacy code, which is, is, is not really fun. Um, it's, a, it's an idea, when I look at it, that's, that isn't that attractive, particularly uh, for a lot of these characteristics of legacy code bases. So legacy code bases mean you need to work in an existing tech stack. Um, and those might be tech stacks that grew organically over a lot of years, like ours, where they, you know, they're a little bit quirky. There are parts of it that, you know, if I were to start again today, maybe I, I wouldn't do it that way. Um, but there certainly were reasons that, that that happened, whether they be historical or whether they be, you know, unique to the problem space that we are solving. Uh, it means that you have to use old frameworks and libraries. And this doesn't mean bad frameworks or libraries. It just means things that are older. Um, in some spaces, this is good, but it also means that, you know, there might be a community around it or there might not. Um, they might have the newest technology or they might not. But you have a lot of code existing already in these environments. And it means you have to work with technical debt. Um, all applications have technical debt. And so when you have to dive into your legacy code, it means you have to look at that and kind of face that head on. And, and none of this is, is attractive, I think, to, to front end devs. But, but I think one of the, like, the most important things about a legacy code base is that it actually works, right? Um, I, I mean, this is this is amazing uh, quote by, um, by Hendrik, um, who's a, the, the creator of uh, Ampersand. Um, I really like it. Like he says that you don't really have to burn down your whole house if you want to remodel the kitchen, right? So uh, I mean, I think that's a great analogy to software development. And I really like my living room. I really like the bathroom. I, I mean, I really like all the other rooms in my my house, right? So, um, so, so we have a lot of good things that are going for us, right? So we also have uh, we use shared templates. Um, so we actually have mustache templates that are shared on the server side and the client side. Um, so we, we like that part. We um, we have very fast server side rendering because we use uh, like a C++ uh, extension for mustache on PHP. Um, we also have a lot of existing backbone components. So for example, like you know carousels, modals, and things like that. So we don't want to get rid of those. So we really like all of that stuff. Um, but there were things that we liked that were out there already. Um, there were things that were like we liked that are in libraries that had been built in the last few years. They're really sources of innovation, um, and they're inspiring for us. So as our application, again, became more and more interactive, fast client-side rendering was really attractive. And we looked at libraries out there that were a lot better than what we were doing right now. Uh, one of the big pieces of this was using virtual DOM, this idea that we could do our diffing of our DOM in memory, not actually have to hit the DOM until we need to, and be able to batch and do precise DOM updates with an abstraction that was, uh, was a lot easier to deal with. We like this idea that we didn't have to do DOM manipulation um, with a lot of these new frameworks. Um, we really didn't want our devs having to work with the DOM directly. It was not a scalable architecture. It was not maintainable. And it ended up with a lot of the messes uh, and the bugs that we had to work with. And we ended up having to like search down these obscure bugs. Like You see something change on the page, but you don't know what changed it. Um, maybe the DOM breakpoint is helpful. Maybe it isn't. And so that can be uh, uh, particularly challenging. So what do we do now again? <laughs> seems to be a recurring question. Yeah. Um, it was. So we looked at what we had. Uh, we looked at what was out there. And we were kind of faced with a dilemma. Um, it really fe wasn't feasible to rewrite everything we had. Uh, but it wasn't feasible to keep going down the path that we were going. And so we decided to kind of take uh, some advice from that idea of modularity to take this idea that we can look at the individual pieces of our application. Um, the ones that we liked, the ones that we wanted to swap out, and do that um, on a library by library basis. 
And there were a lot of really interesting libraries out there that we could do that with. And so we ended up uh, uh, looking for libraries that would take all these pieces that uh, we wanted. So the first thing that we did was look for a better way to pre-compile our mustache templates. Um, there's this library out of The Guardian called Reactive. And Reactive's uh, kind of made for, for as a client-side framework. And it was cool. We, we weren't as interested in, in some of the API pieces and the front-end side of it. But what we realized is that we could pull out the uh, compiler that they were using for uh, mustache templates and use that on our server when we pre-compile our templates to compile them to objects rather than strings. So we did that. Um, we swapped out our, our compiler uh, on the server side. Uh, then we went to this idea of virtual DOM. Uh, there's this library called Mercury. It's sort of a smaller library. has some of the same ideas of, uh, of using virtual DOM. But it decouples its virtual DOM library as its own uh, module, which was cool. So we could actually pull out this library. Again, we really weren't as interested in the API on Mercury. It didn't have the mustache templates that we wanted for, uh, for writing our markup. But it did have this core functionality for diffing and patching that we needed on the client side. And so we used that along with our reactive pre-compiled templates to uh, do our diffing on the client. And then we used Backbone, which we were already using um, across our code base, to do our normal event binding and handle our data layer. Um, we added a few features into this. So we actually had an event, uh, global event handler similar to, uh, to React to handle virtual events. So bind all our events in one place as opposed to binding them all around our document and delegating from there. Uh, and we wrote an integration library to pull this all together. Um, we call that library uh, Tungsten. Uh, we open sourced it a couple uh, months ago. So that was uh, kind of exciting. Uh, and it's certainly not something that will fit into you know, everyone's tech stack. But it made a lot of sense for us. It made a lot of sense for us because at its core, it has this idea of modularity that it wants to be able to have the ability to swap out different pieces. So for example, we're using the virtual DOM library from the Mercury project. But we have an adapter so that we can swap in any virtual DOM library that we want. And we've benchmarked it with different implementations in the past. And that's something that we can do if, uh, you know, if something comes down the line a few years from now um, and we want to pull in. Uh, it uses Backbone in our code base, but that's set a separate la layer. So we're, not, we're, we're decoupled from Backbone itself. Um, and we have implementations in other front-end frameworks as well. Um, so that's certainly something as we look to like, how we want to handle our data on the client side and maybe how we want to use uh, an API for building out our views, we can change that down the line without replacing the whole thing. And so what we're able to do is, is write something that, that really worked for us and work within our tech stack. And I think at the start of it, we were sort of afraid of, of writing something new. Um, you know, there's the not invented here syndrome, right? That you know, we, need, we need to just write everything in-house. And that's very, that's very true. Right? A lot of places, um, I'm sure ourselves included to some extent, we, we write a lot of stuff in-house that maybe we could use externally. Um, that being said, I think there's, there's kind of the opposite end of that. There are teams that don't want to write anything because they're afraid that you know, they couldn't do it as well as, as anything else is out there. Um, and maybe they couldn't, but you all have like, unique problems. Um, a lot of us are facing very interesting problems. For us, it was that we're not a single page app. Um, we weren't going to be. There are a lot of reasons that we couldn't switch to a single page app. Um, SEO just being one of them, um, and that's certainly um, changing. But even that aside, I think there's something to be said for delivering a page that's uh, fully rendered to our user, a page that progressively falls back and works without JavaScript, which is something that was very important to us as well. Uh, so all of these kind of features made us a, a little bit more unique, I think, than some of your, your normal single page applications. Uh, there's this, also this idea that we discovered of using existing infrastructure. And this is a picture of barbed wire fence. And I read this really cool story um, a few months ago. And it's that at the early part of the 20th century, as telephone was sort of making its way across the United States, it was really expensive to lay new wires, um, especially in parts of the country that were vast and there were, there were large distances between houses. And so in the Great Plains, in the American West, we had whole swaths of land that just wasn't affordable to lay new telephone wires. The telephone companies just weren't interested in it because um, it was just way too expensive. And so what farmers did um, in, a, in a very, uh, I think, in a way that's similar to how hackers approach problems is they looked at what they had already. Uh, they had a lot of these barbed wire fences that actually joined entire farms so that they could separate land. And that's how they kept animals from roaming between farms. And they realized that you know, the infrastructure was already there. They could leverage those barbed wires um, to actually transmit telephone uh, uh, signals um, across large areas of land 
without having to build anything new. And so that's what they did. Uh, these groups of farmers just came together and they started uh, implementing uh, telephone um, uh, infrastructure through their existing uh, barbed wire fences. And this was really interesting to me because I, I looked at this and I said, you know, it's not perfect. Like maybe the signal was a little bit worse. Um, maybe they had to maintain it a little bit more. But at the end of the day, they had a telephone service that they just weren't going to get otherwise. And sure, it would have been great if they could have gotten new, new telephone poles and, and strung up new brand new copper across the whole country. But that wasn't going to happen for years. Um, and it wasn't affordable. And it was far too expensive. And that sounded really familiar. So you know, what we were able to do is, is take the existing infrastructure that we had um, with its good parts and with its bad parts and write something new that, that gave us the features that we wanted. Um, so that, that's tungsten. And uh, so I'm just going to show uh, uh, some demos here. Um, how many of you have seen the DB Monster um, demo implementation? All right, so a few of you. Um, I'm just going to pull one up here. So uh, this is DB Monster in Angular. And Ryan Florence demoed this at React Conf this year. And it's just a really basic application that uh, updates this set of this table to sort of simulate the idea of a uh, database monitoring, uh, cluster monitoring app. And so we have data that's changing very quickly. And we have hundreds of rows, um, which for some applications uh, might be the case. So if you have very, uh, if you have a lot of database clusters, that you might need to monitor or anything you need to monitor. Uh, you certainly have applications that are updating this fast. Uh, so we you have implementations in all different libraries. And the interesting thing about this is that we're able to see how quickly we're able to update a table with 200 rows. Um, it actually says 100, but it's 200 because it has master and slave for each row. And then we can see how slow it is. So the slower ones will drop frames because the JavaScript won't be able to, to handle the updates. Um, and the browser will, uh, will, will start dropping frames, so you'll kind of see the drink. So, um, this is Angular 1.3, which I think was um, several months ago. But uh, so let's see. We have uh, we have a little bit of jank as I scroll. I don't know how uh, how well this shows up on the projector. I'm gonna pull up the uh, console, and I have a function called uh, run timer. So, uh, so run timer will run over five seconds, and it'll see how many uh, times you can run uh, render in a second over a course of five. So it'll sample. OK, so we get 4.4 renders per second. So that, that's you know, pretty good. But it definitely is janky here. Um, all right. So now we have uh, Ember 1. Now, uh, this is a little problematic because it tends to crash the browser tab sometimes. All right, so we get occasional updates. All right, so down to about uh, one render a second. So that's, that's a little slow. Um, and of course, these are synthetic benchmarks, but I think they're useful to see, in, in, in this case, um, how fast we can, uh, we can update our DOM. So when Ryan Florence demoed this, um, it was all about React, right? So this is React. Uh, we run it over five seconds. And we're able to get 10 renders a second. So that's pretty fast. Um, it's really smooth. If I scroll down here, uh, very little drink. All right, so uh, Ember implemented the Glimmer engine recently. Um, take their own approach to uh, updating the DOM. And uh, just as fast as React now. So that was really exciting at EmberConf this year. So we get nine renders a second, so just about at, at React speeds. So we looked at, at all this. Um, this was sort of what we looked at before we wrote Tungsten. And we were like, we really want to be this fast. Um, we knew we couldn't do it with our current infrastructure. But you know, as we realized that we couldn't rewrite everything, we knew we probably wouldn't get to those speeds. And we wanted to sort of be in the same ballpark. That was kind of the goal. Um, so let's see what we can get. OK, we have tungsten. Um, the drink doesn't look too bad. Let's see what we got for renders. All right. so. Um, 10 or a second, so pretty, pretty close to, uh, to Ember, Glimmer, and React. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we were really happy with it. And you know, we looked at this, and at the end of the day, if you know, a few renders 
more, more or less per second wasn't um, really a game changer. Um, but it was, it was cool to, to be there and kind of be in that space and realize that we could do it, um, you know, taking our existing, our existing infrastructure. Um, I have this last library that I want to demo. And there's this really lightweight library called Paperclip. And it does diffing in a little bit different way. Uh, it's really fast. So what's interesting about this is we looked around and we realized there's still more work that we can do. There's still places that we can improve. Um, there are still optimizations that we can make in terms of uh, updating parts of our page or uh, doing diffing faster or uh, conditionally doing diffing based on our changing data. The interesting thing is that we can do this ourselves now as opposed to having to rely on a library to do that for us. Um, we can start to find places in our own code, in our own implementations, and see where it's useful to uh, make it faster, um, where it might give us the most uh, benefit. So if I pull up uh, uh, this library, which we've uh, We've been looking at it, that's really fast. Um, and this is actually going to be quite fast than any of the implementations. Uh, yeah, 30 renders a second. Um, so the point being, you know, d there's more work to do. And it, it's nice to be able to do that in our existing infrastructure and make progress in a way that makes sense for, uh, for our use cases and for our customers. And uh, yeah, we'd, we'd love uh, to hear your feedback on Tungsten. Um, I have stickers, because apparently you've made it like as a library if you, you know, get your own stickers. So, uh, all right, thank you. <laughs>